Hello there, uh, my name is Victor and today I would like to share with you some of my thoughts and some of the processes that I've been learning and practicing regarding syntropic agroforestry. Uh, I really hope that that helps you to, to deepen your understanding of the, the syntropic framework, let's call it. Uh, but most importantly, I hope it helps you to interact with your system in a, in a better way, in a more flexible, perhaps in a more realistic way uh, as you are managing your agroforestry systems. So for me, since, since the very beginning, since when I started, did my first course back in 2016, uh, I always had many, many questions about it because uh, the framework, the philosophy and the principles, they are so strong and so well presented. Uh, but I always had questions regarding you know, the generality, perhaps, of those principles. And as I live in Australia, for me, one of the first questions I had was how can we actually translate those systems and that production method, that productive method that uh, it's clearly working for some people in Brazil, uh, how can we bring it into the Australian socio-economic uh, context, which is, if you think about it, is the absolute opposite to what we have in Brazil. Um, and so that's how probably my first question when we not only brought Syntropic to Australia in 2017 when we ran the first courses, but also when, uh, when we started Gabala Farm, which was the first Syntropic farm uh, in Australia back in, in, the, in the end of 2016. So how do we do that translation? And as more, the more I worked with the methodology, then bigger questions perhaps started to emerge. Uh, I started to try and think, you know, okay, how do we then translate that into other climates? Because Australia, Brazil, yes, socioeconomically very different, but climatic quite similar, mostly kind of tropical and subtropical. Um, and then it kind of started to go bigger and bigger. How do we move from concept into reality? Because even with the similarities of the count of the countries, I was still finding issues uh, because there was a lot of copy and pasting, a lot of, oh, this is the recipe of how you do it. Um, and it wasn't really translating well over here. And then perhaps my last question, or one that I've been carrying with me for a long, long time as well, is given the, the power of syntropic agroforestry, uh, how come there is not so many uh, commercial players, so many commercial farms that are actually able to take it to that level, to the level of economic viability, which, you know, it is paramount. And even in Australia, since we brought it, um, the idea here in 2017, uh, you know, in my understanding, Australia is kind of the forefront of syntropic agroforestry outside of Brazil. Uh, even here, there is very, very few people that are able to take it to the commercial level, really, if any, uh, you know, to be truly commercial where we are not really dependent on, the, on volunteers, on woofers, on students to carry out the, you know, the large amount of work that it requires. So in order then to kind of try to work with those questions, to me questioning is what really drives, you know, my practice. I'm always looking and trying to understand, you know, why things are happening and how come those, uh, those things are rising up. So in order to try and clarify that, I then started to then move backwards perhaps and move into, all right, as Ennis started to, you know, come up with those theories and those ideas, you know, what are the fundamental elements? What are the key characteristics that perhaps if we understand that background, we'll then be able to do those translations and understand and hopefully move into a pathway where there is more people uh, able to take it to the commercial level. And, you know, there is this polarity, perhaps, where there is a lot of people saying to be, econo to be regenerative needs to be, needs to be economic. But in my understanding, you know, very soon into the future, to be economic, it needs to be regenerative. So either or, we need to start to be able to move in that direction in, way or on, in one way or another. So going back into you know, syntropy and perhaps a little bit of what is the, 
the macro uh, the macroscopic world view that Ernest presents, uh, I think, in my understanding, is that everything starts with the planet. So basically, we live in a planet, planet Earth, and it has a function, it has a desire as well by itself to evolve, to accumulate, to complexify, and in doing so, to then be able to differentiate, to create different forms of life, perhaps. And it also has a, you know, part of its function within the macrocosmic is that it balances out the energy that is coming out of the sun. So basically the sun is moving into a process that we could perhaps call an entropic process, where it is moving from something that is complex to something that is simple, and in doing that is dissipating energy. So it's losing energy or losing capacity to do work if we want to uh, talk in a thermodynamic uh, terms. While the planet do the opposite. The planet has a tendency to accumulate. It has a tendency to complexify. And so that's why we talk about, you know, syntropy being that movement of complexification. And the planet has then a syntropic function or a syntropic job to do. And in order for the Earth to be able to do and fulfill that function, which is also its desire because it allows it to to evolve, it has chosen uh, life as its uh, instrument, as Ernest puts. So life is the instrument that allows the planet to then accumulate, to evolve, to differentiate. And life then, in this planet, what, what supports life? I mean, I know that there is a lot of uh, phenomena that supports life, but fundamentally speaking, you know, it's photosynthesis. At least in terms of the material life, uh, we require photosynthesis to be able to do that process. So through a photosynthetic process, uh, plants are able to harness uh, the sun, uh, the energy from the sun, uh, and in doing so is then able to accumulate energy to secure that energy, does not allow it to dissipate out, and then it starts to be able to accumulate and complexify. So Earth relies on photosynthesis in order for it to fulfill its function. And that's done through a living process. Uh, so then looking further ahead, you know, syntropic, you know, the, the theory of syntropy also puts, and it seems to be well scientifically backed up, that uh, the planet, you know, before this very increased power of impact, perhaps, that humans have been doing onto the planet, the planet, 95% of it was actually occupied by forests or some type of some type of woodland, you know, maybe savannas, woodland, and that type of things, a bit more sparse than a forest. But to me, the important, the important element here is that once we have a forest structure, then we are starting to move in another dimension. So we're starting to move into height, uh, and in doing so, we start to have layers. And if you look at your batteries, the batteries that it's powering this camera, or the batteries that is in your phone. Uh, batteries, how are they organized? They are organized in layers. So we have layers and layers and layers that are able then to hold the charge. So this to me, it's very important and why Syntropic pushes so much into that forest organism is that it is part of the actual the mechanism that the planet has chosen and has evolved into as it uh, over time to be able to not only capture the sunlight, but store the sunlight. So I think we have two very important processes. One is how we convert that energy into matter, into sugars, into glucose, and the other is how do we store it uh, and don't allow it to just simply get discharged as the year goes by. And that is done through life, through a living process, actually. Uh, I much prefer to use the verb than the noun, 
because this uh, requires, you know, the syntropic process requires a perpetual motion. Um, so, in my understanding, when we think between the polarities of syntropy and entropy, they are not part of that same cycle that it goes syntropy and then goes entropy and goes syntropy again, but they are more in a spiraling uh, movement where as you move up in the spiral, you are complexifying, you are making things bigger, and it's always moving through life. But as soon as you remove the life processes, uh, then things start to spiral down towards an entropic uh, motion. And to me, the most simple example is if you've got a tree and you cut that tree down and you bring that down onto the ground and allow the biology of the soil to decompose that, to me, that's not an entropic process. That's still a syntropic process because that biology now will be able to take that organic matter that has been complexified by plants and it will transform that into some humic substances which then allows and creates conditions for a higher successional stage to move about. Contrary to that, if you take that same piece of wood and you just leave it standing uh, you know, in the weather without, in, without being in contact with the ground, then that living process stops. Not only that top, that plant stopped to photosynthesize, uh, but also it didn't continue on that motion with life. It's just sitting there and basically weathering, going through oxidation. Uh, and then it's losing capacity, is simplifying uh, without really adding anything else. And it's similar to perhaps a more tangible example. If we take that same piece of wood and we burn it, so we're doing the same thing. We now are very, very entropic and we are moving, we are removing the life process out of the equation. And if we think about it, uh, the whole of our industry, the whole of our technology is based on an entropic movement. We basically remove the life out of the equation and now we utilize what life has created. Be it oil, be it coal, be it you know, anything really that has this explosive type of energy. So the planet works not in an explosive motion that releases heat, but in an implosive motion that actually cools things down and then complexifies. So with that in mind then, it's my understanding that this kind of um, yeah, understanding of that process, of that row, then gave rise to many other observations from Ernst, which then gives rise to a lot of the practices and principles that we apply in our syntropic systems. So if we just move it over here, I'm going to take it from the photosynthesis. So the goal of syntropic agroforestry and many other regenerative uh, approaches, this is not something new, holistic management does that as well, and everything else, we are looking about the photosynthetic capacity. Uh, but to me, syntropy presents uh, things in a little bit more complex way, but I think more powerful way as well. And as I understand, it has, you know, more or less, in my view, seven very key principles or what I'm calling seven very key elements for us to work with. So one that we are very, very, very familiar with is successional. So our forestry systems are successional. So that means then that we have a time factor into it. Uh, and through succession or through time, now we have a system that moves from a 3D, let's say, to something that is 4D. So it's four dimensional. And that time factor, it's not the easiest thing to grasp. In my observations, uh, humans are not the best to deal with time. Uh, it's something that still tricks us a fair bit. We are, great, we, uh, we are great at understanding space in three dimensions, but once time comes in and now we have movement, that becomes a little bit more difficult. But anyway, we talk a lot about succession of plants and how things move along the way. Um, the next 
uh, principle or practice that we talked about is that our forests must be stratified. Uh, and by stratified, now we bring it into those layering processes. So now we're starting to form our battery um, that gets bigger and bigger over time. So those two are usually the most talked about principles in Syntropic Egg. And I understand why they are kind of easy to grasp. The concept is quite easy to understand. So we focus a lot of attention onto those. Uh, but them alone, in my understanding, there is something that is missing in the process. So there is another one of those more conceptual principles, in my understanding, which is analogous, uh, which means you know, it has a similarity too. So what we, what we have to think is for us to have increased or optimized photosynthetic capacity, we have to design and implement and manage our systems in a way that that system resembles a forest or woodland structure that it used to be or that was supposed or that it is supposed to be here. So it's very important to use and select plants that are able to withstand our current capacities. And I mean, I know that there is a lot within those categories and I will go into a little bit more details in the following video. Uh, today, I really just wanna present the framework and, and how I see things moving about. So one side of the equation, we have those more conceptual principles and practices perhaps. And then on the other side, uh, the more I think about it, we also have three that are more practical in my understanding. Um, and the first one then is biodiverse. So we need to work with forests that have diversity. So just have, you know, two layers of uh, strata with just two types of plants, it's not really optimizing that process. We need to start to use a lot more life capacity. Uh, both in terms of plants, but also, and perhaps even more important, is how do we include the animal, that animal element into it, be it, you know, big animals, cattle or anything like that, but also how do we doubt to the microbial population in our soils? I my practice, I'm trying to pay a lot more attention on how we go into the animal realm, which is, again, it adds another layer of complexity. And you know, with that biodiversity, we also start to look at who, you know, which, which biodiversity am I able to actually practically and realistically bring into my systems. Because too much diversity, depending on the scale and the capacity for management, could actually become a problem. So plant selection, it's very, very important. And how we're gonna be managing that through time and how we have those uh, organized in our systems. So the next one is one that uh, it's kind of implicit, but not too many people really focus about. And in my understanding is the very key, is the one that pretty much puts syntropy in another dimension relative to other practices, which is dynamic. So by dynamic, in my understanding, is we have a lots of movement. Movement in terms of things that are contracting and things that are expanding and contracting and expanding. So within this entropic spiral, we have many cycles that are expansive and then cycles that are contractive. And the better we become at understanding when the system is expanding and when it's time to then contract, the better, the more productive we need, the more productive we can become. So this is really, to me, directly related to production. All of those, they are kind of related, indirectly related. To me, they are much more related into the regeneration of the planet, into the mechanism of the planet. But if we want to have production, then we have to master that movement. And that's not easy to be done. There is certainly no recipes. It is a learning on the job kind of approach. There is no other way in my experience. And the final one, which is kind of talked about, but I don't think it's given enough 
attention, which then relates straight back into that dynamic principle, is that syntropic agroforestry is process-based. And to be process-based, it sounds simple again, conceptually, but in practice, it actually requires a shift in our consciousness. Because in modern humanity, um, if you observe, everything we do tends to be with an outcome mentality. So I'll do this because I will get that. Whereas with Syntropic Egg, in my experience, is if you have that mentality, you actually start to make very, very poor decisions. Especially when we start to move into the economic realm, be it commercial or be it, you know, perhaps a, uh, an interest on the subsistence level for a crop or for an yield, we start to make decisions that we have an outcome for this tomato to produce uh, and we start to make decisions that then actually compromises some of those key elements and uh, what we do then is that we start to weaken our systems. So we got to be careful that we don't eat our placentas uh, rather than have that placenta to really generate and create a very strong embryonic forest. Because this, in my thinking, in my understanding, is the goal. So, and how we move from our placenta stages, from our first, you know, lettuces and cucumbers to that process in an economic way is where to me is the one million dollar questions and to me as i observe it's highly what it's highly individualized it's really all about that human being that is in charge either the landowner or the managers or the employees whichever human being is part of that system they need what they need to be included in it and to me this is the kind of the seventh perhaps element within a practical syntropic framework that more and more I hear people in Brazil talk about. And in Brazil they tend to bring that more into like a legal framework because anytime if you own a, a piece of rural land as part of the legal structure you have to set aside a proportion of that land uh, for what they call an area of permanent protection. It's like a, you know, an area where humans are not welcome, let's say. So the nature is left alone. And more and more, as we start to see that those ideas are actually highly regenerative, now there is a push, uh, not now, but it's been for a while, and we are getting some momentum that those areas now, instead of being areas of permanent exclusion, are now being areas that we are permanently included. But I would like to take this further. I would like to take this inclusivity of the human, not only in that legal framework, but also as a key element in managing this relationship that it's really, really complex. And a lot of times, you know, very conceptual and others still conceptual, but not so easy to grasp practically. So my interest for the last you know, four years since I've been in this property and I've planted about two and a half acres worth of a whole range of systems is of course trying to understand those dynamics but also understanding what is the difference once we have humans that are actually inclusive in it or when you have humans that are coming here simply to do a job. And when we've started Gabala Farm, I was living basically 25 meters, 25 minutes away from it. And that meant that my process of learning the movement, the dynamic movements within those forestry systems were lacking. I was coming already into those systems with an outcome or with a job to do. And what that meant is that I kept making the same mistakes all over again because I was not really what I was not including myself in the system was everything about the biology about perhaps some economic return about this about that but I couldn't see myself reflected in that system so when I think about it 
uh, I, I'm, what I'm really interested in, that's what I really try to work in my courses, is how do we bring that human element, how do, we, uh, do I bring my individuality, me as Victor, into my systems? Because what I've been observing is that if that person is not part of that system, if we are following our status quo of, let's say, a farm where you have perhaps a landowner that is not even participating or is too busy just doing the administration or the financials, then that farm really struggles. And furthermore, the relationship with our employees must also change because we require that those employees that we have to be a key, a fundamental part of our systems. Because in the end of the day, they are the ones really doing what? Observing. Observing the changes in diversity. Observing when the systems are growing and how all of a sudden they start to really slow down on the growth and things start to get a bit tense. And it, the sooner we can pick on those moments, then the better, the smoother the growth and the productivity of the system become. So we actually, part of the key problem in my observations when we're looking at commercial systems is that we are coming with the same mentality where the employee just get told what to do and that is really then becoming really tricky. Of course, we have all the layers and I'll talk about the economic challenges in another video. But to me, it's about doing that. It's how do we include humans in the system and how they can see themselves. So that system needs really to be not tailor-made to our climate or to our land, but a combination, a harmonious combination between that human and the land and the climate and the community where we're going to sell or what do I like to eat or not. So how do we facilitate that process then? So in my thinking, what I've been observing that is really helping me to watch, to manage the system, because that's the, that's the thing. As we all know, 95% of Syntropic Egg is about management. No questions about it. And to me, it's actually 99%. You know, implementation and design are, you know, are very important, absolutely. But I've seen systems that are poorly designed with somebody that's really present and that are really able to take it along and systems that have the perfect design, but the people involved are just so distant that it just turned into a mess. Um, so to me, then I go back into the photosynthetic process and say, okay, it's not only about light and a lot of the syntropic principles are based on light, you know, the north to south direction are light oriented. So the more light, more photosynthesis. And I go, yes, I understand that, but you know, there is a lot more to photosynthesis than light. So when we think about it, you know, what a key ingredient for us, for everywhere is what? It's carbon dioxide. So we need air for it to to produce photosynthesis. It's part of the photosynthetic process. And I know in our forest that might not be a problem, but I've worked and I've done lots of research into hydroponics that are in an enclosed environment. And if you don't have CO2 being injected, it's quite bizarre actually, then the photosynthetic capacity drops. As simple as that. But what I want to bring your attention is that we have an element within CO2, which is the element of the air. We also need water. That's a no-brainer. Uh, no water, no photosynthesis, or very limited photosynthesis, or at least the range of plants that we can use becomes very, very limited. Uh, if you're moving both sides of the polarity, either too much water or not enough water. So that brings us then to the element water. We then need light, but light doesn't come by itself. It's out, there is also a relationship with warmth. Uh, and we know that, you know, photosynthesis to be optimized, we need the temperatures between, let's say, 15 and 25 degrees is where photosynthesis is at its optimal. Uh, way, for, way past 25, let's say, to 40 degrees Celsius or way lower to, let's say, below zero, photosynthesis becomes much more difficult. Uh, so here we have perhaps a fire element. And what else? We need something else. We need the plant. So we need the plant. Without the plant, there is no photosynthesis. And to me, the plant is really kind of a, an image of the earth. 
like the earth uh, element, as it is composed of lots of minerals. Right, so we have four key elements for that to happen, but that is actually not enough. If I cut a piece of leaf and I put it in sunlight and I have water and air, is photosynthesis gonna happen? No. We need one more key element, which is what? The one we've been talking about, it's life. So we need something that is able to organize this in a living, in a cooling way. So in an implosive way, let's say. And for me then, this element, which you know, in a plant form is the plant itself, it's a living plant, in our agroforestry, for me, is the human element. So again, we can then have a direct relationship between the human in charge and all those natural ecological elements that they need to be in balance. They must be in balance. Because there is, you know, if you have too much water, but not enough light or warmth or not enough plants to produce photosynthesis, then your photosynthetic capacity will drop. It's as simple as that. So turning then this understanding into this framework, which is really, this is our practical framework, how we move about in our systems, then I can then simply just translate that into we have the earth, element there, we have our water element coming into here, we have our earth, oh, sorry, our air element going now up, and now our fire element coming here, and I really like how um, holistic management bring those ecological processes, I mean that mandala by itself, it's very powerful, and I will have a video just on that, because that goes way beyond those, we can actually extrapolate into quite a few other processes that help us in that decision-making process on what to manage, how to manage, when to manage, which is very, to me, the most difficult and important question is when are we going to induce that dynamic movement? And that is dependent on really the macro, the macrocosmic realm. There is a lot of you know, climates and weather patterns that if you are not paying attention, and I've done it so many, you, if you go by the book, in spring I do that, and in March I do that, and in winter I do that, it's, it's dangerous. So, but coming back into that framework, holistic management brings then what? We have our mineral cycle down the bottom, which to me kind of clearly relates to the earth element. We have the water cycle also in the bottom because they both kind of gravitationally pulled down the bottom here where we can really look about those cycles. Over here then we have what? Our community dynamics. So that's our, our plant community, our biology that needs to go beyond plants. Plants is just one part. It helps, but plants without other biological aspects, they don't go anywhere. And then finally, we have an energy flow here in our fire flow, in our fire pole. So by looking into that now, the human being is very powerful in understanding how is our system moving. Because if you think that this is a square, and a square they must have equal sides, we can very clearly identify as I look in my systems there, you can't see, but I can, I can see, you know, where are the problems? Why is the system not performing? Or how can I uh, optimize? How can I make it perhaps move faster? Or how can I slow it down for whatever the reason if I can't be there managing so often? So with that in mind, we are now very tangible and I'll just shift this figure into here because now the human being it's in control the human being is what the balancing element the tempering element things the human being through its capacity to observe and its freedom to act once we are looking at realistic things not so much conceptual things but the reality of our systems then that human it's able to really make some really good decisions on a very timely manner. So that's it. That's it for this video. Uh, I just wanted to really present and put it out there. Uh, this has been years of research and practice. Uh, I really hope it helps you 
and in your understanding of you know syntropy, which can be quite overwhelming. But most importantly, it helps you to engage in your systems in another level, in a more real, more tangible, more sensorial level by observing this and kind of being part and inviting yourself to be really part of that system because together, without that human being, then management becomes really difficult. And you can't manage from the computer. You can't manage from a mile away. You've got to be, and you can't even manage from the outside of the system looking out. You've got to get in. It's what holistic management always says. You know, if you, if you look at the paddock and it looks green, yes, you've got to get in and look down. You know, have you got bare soil or not? From here, everything looks beautiful, but when you get in, you start to see, hey, these plants are not liking, not enjoying. That one is what's happening. Doom, 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 doom. So the most important part in my understanding to take Syntropic Egg to the next level. NS has done such an amazing job. Uh, you know, the, the framework, the ecological relationships to me, I never seen anybody bring it so clearly and so precise. But to me, it's lacking the humanity now. How do you bring humans into those systems in a way that is harmonious for everybody? So anyway, I hope that helps. Uh, it would really, really help me if you can share your thoughts, share your questions, because uh, that will help me to present that information a bit better and it will help me as well to think a bit more deeper. Uh, if you are interested in, in that kind of depth, in your systems. I do run some uh, online courses. They are very individualized because they have to be given what I'm presenting. So, so yeah, head into syntropicgardener.com, uh, send me an email, find me on Facebook. Uh, we are over there. Uh, thank you so, so much for, for listening and thank you even better if you can send me some questions. It will really help me out. All right, have a wonderful day. And I'll see you next time because I will have now have all the videos, one just about this part, one about that part, one about the human inclusivity, and then one about that part that will then fulfill this five-part series. All the best. Take it easy.